He is risen. All right, some of you aren't sure about that. If you haven't heard or you're new to the faith, welcome. <laughs> Anytime you hear he is risen, that's a call. The response is louder. He is risen indeed. All right, I'll give you a chance to redeem yourself. He is risen. He is risen Amen, he is. And that's why we're here. If you're a guest, welcome. My name is Pastor Matt. I'm the lead pastor here in you make our services better. Thank you so much for being here today. If you're tuning in online, a special welcome to you. I would love to meet you and shake your hand after church. Please stick around and say hello. Today we finish the exciting conclusion of our evidence series, and it's all been leading up to this, the resurrection. Now, most Easter's pastors kind of have that, that box we have to play in, these scriptures we're expected to read and stuff. Today we're throwing that out the window because the potter's hand, we do things differently. And we're going to go a little cerebral today, a little weird. I hope you nerd out with me on this because this is going to be awesome. The last two or three weeks we've been drinking from a fire hose on full. Have your pens ready. Have your heart ready because God's word is going to speak to us. We're going to look at a different passage. If you want to find it, we're going to get to it in 1 Corinthians. And uh, I want to put a, a little picture here. Does anybody remember this movie? came out a few years ago, Case for Christ. Anybody remember it? Awesome, awesome movie. It's right down my alley. This is exactly what we're talking about. Lee Strobel, if you're not sure who he is, he was an atheist. He was an investigative journalist who did not like Christianity. He was also the legal editor, so he was into law firms and court cases, all this stuff, evidence-based. He was a legal editor for the Chicago Tribune, all right? So he's no lightweight. He knows what he's doing. And in his effort to disprove the claims of the resurrection, over the course of two years, God was working on his heart, and finally he broke down and said, I give up. The evidence is overwhelming. I literally can no longer hold to my atheist beliefs. And he became a follower of Christ. And he wrote The Case for Christ, The Case for the Creator, all these incredible bestsellers. He's a pastor. But a lot of people don't realize he had a TV show called Faith Under Fire. And on this TV show, he brought in people you would not expect who would be willing to talk about spiritual beliefs. And he would interview skeptics and agnostics and atheists and even hedonists. And get this, he interviewed probably the most famous hedonist of them all, this man right here. Here's a picture of him, boom, right there. Anybody know who that is? Yeah, right, and if you don't, good for you. Good for you, don't even research it, all right? Last year, his initials are HH. Last year I talked about Howard Hughes. This is another HH, this is Hugh Hefner. I don't know why he agreed to be interviewed by Lee Strobel, but he did. And Lee went at it. He, he didn't hold back. He asked him all kinds of spiritual questions. And as you would expect, <laughs> Hugh Hefner had a, uh, shall we say, a minimal belief in God. He was a hedonist. He was after pleasure. And he kind of was lighthearted and aloof, and he smiled, and he was his jovial self. And then the topics changed. Now picture this. Lee Strobel is sitting in the famous L.A. mansion. Yes, that mansion in the living room interviewing Lee Strobel, interviewing Hugh Hefner about his spiritual beliefs. And it was kind of lighthearted, and he would refer to him, you know, in, in very loose terms, like, oh, he's the beginning of it all, or he's the great unknown. But when Lee Strobel brought up the resurrection, when Lee Strobel brought up today, what we saw with today, his whole demeanor changed. Gone was the bravado. Gone was the lighthearted boyishness. And he said, Hugh Hefner sat up, almost as if he was sobered up, and he suddenly saw the, the supreme relevance of the resurrection. And in this rare moment of lucidity, he makes this statement. He says, if one had any real evidence, there's that word, that indeed Jesus did return from the dead, then that is the beginning of a dropping of a series of dominoes that takes us to all kinds of wonderful th what what is he I'm like oh come on he's gonna get saved this is it and then he said it assures us of an afterlife I'm like yes yes it assures us of all kinds of things that we all hope are true and to that he's right but then he dismissed it he admitted he'd never even taken the time to investigate the claims of christ He'd never even looked into the evidence of the resurrection. And finally, he dismissed it, and he says, I don't think that Jesus is any more the Son of God than you or I. And he missed it. He was right about one thing. 
If the resurrection is true, it changes everything. If it's true, then that opens the door for every one of us to find forgiveness, to find hope, to find new life, to know the Savior, to have our sins forgiven, to have eternal life. But if the resurrection falls, if it's false, if it's a lie, if it's a hoax, then we among all people are to be most pitied, as we'll see Paul writes in the scriptures. On Friday, I was hooking up my camper, a 6,000 pound camper. You wanna help me with that? I got it, okay. And this is a trailer hitch. Now, if you're not familiar with it, it's heavy, okay? It is held on by one little pin. It's called a lynch pin or a cotter pin right here, okay? We pulled 6,000 pounds, and as I started looking at this, I realized everything rose or falls on this little piece of aluminum, okay? If you've ever not hooked this up and this pin comes out, uh, it's a scary day. It's a train wreck. The trailer comes unhitched, everything falls apart, and it is absolute disaster. Because everything, that whole 6,000 pounds was dependent on this one little linchpin. Just like that, the resurrection is the linchpin. Everything about your faith, whether you knew it or not, hangs on the resurrection. If it is true, game over, devil, then this is what it's all about. But if it's not, if it's false, if it's a hoax, then what are we doing? <laughs> Let's go to Golden Corral, right? But if it's true, this is why today we focus like a laser on the resurrection. What does it mean? Can it hold up to the evidence? Because if the evidence fails, well, let's just say Paul knew how critical the resurrection was. And this is what he said in chapter 15, verse 17, 1 Corinthians. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. Are you, are you grabbing this? But as it is, oh, there it is. But, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, I know anytime I dig into scriptures, I want to see as much of these translations as I get. And I love the message translation. Check it out with me. Same, same passage. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't, because he was indeed dead. And if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark, as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ in resurrection, because they're already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. Isn't that awesome? I love how that's worked. So as Hefner asked Strobel, is there any real evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? That's the question we're going to explore today. Now, historical sources are numerous. The arguments can get complex. So hear me, we're not going to cover everything in this short time together. We just can't do it. But good news, we boiled it down to three questions that you can take out of here and you can share with your friends. The first question is this. Was Jesus alive at point A? Can we verify that? The second question, was Jesus really dead at point B? And the third, was Jesus alive again at point C? If the answer to these questions is yes, then Jesus did rise from the dead. He is the Son of God, and Christianity is absolutely true. All right, I'm going to dive into the evidence here of the first of these three claims. The first one is this, Jesus was alive at point A. This is probably the easiest one to examine because, let's be honest, virtually every scholar, secular or Christian, agrees that a man named Jesus really did live and he walked the sands of Judea. Most people accept that. Even so, if you go on the internet, there's a lot of people who don't. A lot of tinfoil hat wearing people out there, a lot of conspiracy theorists, they say that it's just a copycat, that Christianity was fake, that it was really stealing its beliefs from earlier mythology. In other words, People say the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen. It was really a story that we Christians plagiarized from earlier ancient myths. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever talked to somebody who fancies himself an intellectual? We see it all the time. It slips into movies. 
This was made popular here by the Da Vinci Code. Some of you may remember that. They said this, nothing in Christianity is original. But here's what's laughable at. Even that idea is not original because that was stolen from skeptics 200 years earlier who wrote that Christianity just stole from earlier myths. This was picked up by wonderful people like Stalin and Lenin, and they became an atheist communist country that led to disaster for their people because they entrenched this dogma that you are it. You are the end of your being, and this is the grave, and that's all there is. When you first hear this, you may be caught off guard. You don't know how to defend that. Your apologetics background may be like, well, what about these myths? What about that? I mean, I know we've heard there's mythological god men that have come and gone. Probably the most famous one is Mithras. Long before Jesus, he was supposed to have lived, and he was also born of a virgin. They said he was born in a cave. He was also considered a great teacher. He had disciples. He sacrificed himself for world peace. He was buried in a tomb and allegedly even rose from the dead. Sound familiar? That's why they call Christianity a copycat religion. But is it? If you evaluate the evidence, it is unbelievable. Respected Swedish scholar here, T.D. Mettinger, has this. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm just going to share a few of them. He says this, the nearly universal consensus of scholars around the world is that there are no examples of any mythological gods dying and rising from the dead that came before Jesus. These resurrection myths came after Christianity. So Christianity could not have done the borrowing. And then Mettinger goes on to say, there is no prima facie evidence, that means at first sight, that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct. All right, so what about those who say Jesus never lived? What about those who, what do you say to that? Well. Our good buddy Bart Ehrman, who holds the distinguished chair over at UNC Chapel Hill, made this, and remember, he's no friend of Christianity. He wrote an entire book attacking the idea of people who say Jesus never lived. He was not a historical person. He says this, he says, I think the evidence is just so overwhelming that Jesus existed that it's silly to talk about him not existing. I don't know anyone who is responsible as a historian who is actually trained in the historical method or anyone who's a biblical scholar who does this for a living who gives any credence at all to any of this. It falls apart on every level. Historian Paul Meyer is even more blunt. He says this, the total evidence is so overpowering, so absolute that only the shallowest of intellects would dare deny Jesus' existence. And guys, I could go on and on about this. There are so many things that the first question, it's just not that much in doubt. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Jesus was alive at point A. So I want to move on to the second point. Jesus was dead at point B. For the resurrection to be true, Jesus really did have to die. Okay? The Bible tells us this. History tells us this. He was executed on a public cross by the Romans in a brutal execution. Pontius Pilate oversaw it. But there are some people who deny the death of Christ. When you study ancient history, they say if you have one, maybe two outside sources that can confirm what you're saying, you're doing good. That's considered lucky. We have not one, not two, not three, not four. We have so many sources. Four of them are biographies written by people in his time period. We know that. We see the Gospels themselves. We also know of five highly respected ancient sources that had nothing to do with the Bible. Outside sources. Famous historians like Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian, Mara Berserapian, the Stoic philosopher who is not a friend of Christianity, not to mention the entire Talmud for Judaism. Think about this. You had every disciple who willingly went to their grave watching their leader be brutally massacred and slaughtered on a cross publicly that everybody saw. They said the disciples would have never made up crucifixion. If this is what they wanted their leader to be known as, they would not have invented this story. But I want to look deeper. Something that fascinates me is the medical aspect of this. If you've ever read the post-mortem autopsies on some of these, you watch some of these autopsy shows or, or CSI, the medical evidence shows there is almost no way someone survives a crucifixion. No one can. It is ruthless. It's performed by a brutal, efficient, cold expert and flogging, not whipping, flogging. I won't go into all the details, but just know that this is not just like Indiana Jones cracking a whip going, ooh, it hurt. This is 
a cat of nine tails, long strips of leather with heavy lead balls at the end, laced with chips of bone and sharp pieces of metal so that when they hit, it stuck. And then it was dragged. And this was done dozens and dozens of times. Before he was even crucified, Jesus was tied to this pole and stretched tight. So much so that these jagged pieces of bones, there was a person who, who actually wrote down what he saw for a Roman flogging. All right, I'm just going to share two sentences. Dr. Alexander Mithril says this, after being flogged, the sufferer's veins were literally laid bare. The very muscles and tendons, even the bowels of the victim were clearly visible and open to full exposure. Every medical doctor says anyone who goes through this is suffering from hypovolemic shock. That's the shock from critical loss of blood. So before Jesus was even brought to the hill and nailed, he was in critical condition. He would be in the ICU and we would be saying, it's already touch and go, okay? So I want you to realize that before he carried his own cross, before dehydration set in, before blood loss took over, then he was nailed to the cross, the spikes driven through his wrist and feet. Crucifixion is designed to be an agonizingly slow death by asphyxiation. That's like suffocation. Because what happens, the stress on the chest locks your lungs in the inhaled position. So to exhale, the victim literally has to push up on the spikes to lessen the stress so that just so they could do the final breath. And they would push up and sag down over and over until they physically exhausted, could no longer do that. And you would die from suffocation and loss of blood. No one, no one, no one survived crucifixion. Because remember, at the end of this, the soldier pierced Jesus' side, split the ribs, went between them and pierced the heart, the pericardium, pierced the lungs and blood and water flow. But if that's still not enough medical evidence, don't forget the expert Roman executioner came up and confirmed he is dead. Even the secular journal of American Medical Association said this, clearly the weight of the historical medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted. Accordingly, interpretations based on that assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Wow. Right? So it's not just Christian scholars who believe. It's not just us who drank the Kool-Aid. We can't be dismissed. We're not, we didn't check our brain at the door. Even secular medical society, even secular agnostics, James Tabor said this, he says, I don't think we need to have any doubt that given Jesus' execution by Roman crucifixion, he was truly dead. The secularist, the atheist scholar, Gerd Ludemann said this, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is in dispute. So why do I say that? But I don't want to just get up here and do easy believism and just say, hey, trust me. There is so much persuasive evidence. Jesus was alive at point A, he was dead at point B, but now we come to the most astounding claim. He was alive again at point C. This is the reason we're here today. Jesus was alive again at point C. And there's two huge strands here that established Jesus came back to life. The first one is this. His tomb was empty. You can't dismiss that. We'll see why in just a minute. The second one is even more put into evidence. He was appearing to people after people after people, group, hundreds of people. So if you're new to the faith, Jesus, after he died, he was taken down from the tomb. He was laid in a, a stone carving, put a huge stone in front of it. It was a tomb by Joseph Arimathea, a wealthy man on the Jewish council. We even know his name. We know where it is. It's common knowledge today. Everyone back then knew about this tomb. He appeared to people, and this was common knowledge. The tomb was then sealed, and then it was guarded. Yet somehow, this morning, on resurrection morning, it was inexplicably empty. How? How do we know the tomb was empty? I did some research this week, and I learned some things I didn't know. The first thing I discovered was there's something called the Jerusalem factor. If you haven't heard of this, this is uh, what scholar William Lane Craig says. He said, the site of Jesus' tomb was well known to Christians and non-Christians alike. If the claim was false, if the tomb was not empty, it would have been highly unlikely for a movement founded on his resurrection to publicly explode and spread like it did. In the same city, it could be verified that he was still there. You could go to the tomb, 
roll it away, and people who doubted could point to Jesus' decaying body. Be honest. If they did that, that would have effectively ended Christianity. It would have been over. If we rolled away the tomb and went, why are y'all talking about him coming back to life? Isn't that him right there? And they could point, and they could look and go, oh, <laughs> my bad. It didn't happen that way. Why? Because the tomb was empty. Secondly, I learned there is a criterion of embarrassment. All right, don't shoot the messenger here. I want to ask a question. That morning, resurrection morning, this morning, who was the first to arrive to discover the empty tomb? Was it men or women? It was the women. God bless the women. This is a problem if you're making up the resurrection. This is a problem because we in the West, we forget this, but in first century Jewish and Roman culture, the testimony of women was not considered reliable. In fact, it wasn't generally even allowed to be testimony in a court. Okay? Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you about the culture of that day. Jewish historian Josephus even said, but never let the testimony of women even be admitted. Okay? So here's the point. If the gospel writers were going to make up a story about the empty tomb, right, out of thin air, culturally, back then, they never would have put in the story that it was women who found the empty tomb. They wouldn't have done it because that would hurt their cause. That would be, quote, an embarrassment to culture. If they had the freedom to make up the story as they saw fit, they would have said Peter or James or some big famous man came to that tomb because that's how they thought back then. Yet, they reported it was women who found the vacant tomb. Why? Because that's what happened. And they were committed to reporting the truth. Women were the ones who showed up. Even if it hurt their cause, even if it was embarrassing, they wanted to tell the truth. But there's more. There's something called enemy attestation. In other words, even the enemies of Jesus admitted the tomb was empty. Remember the skeptics in Jesus' day, they were saying that the disciples broke in and stole the body, right? That was the rumor going around, the disciples stole the body. Matthew reported this, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, all of it, okay? But I wanna ask a question here, okay? Lean in with me here. If that's true, why would they say someone stole the body if it was supposedly still in the tomb? Hmm. Think about this. They're implicitly admitting that the tomb was empty. But now they're trying to find a way to come around and explain how it got empty. So this collapses. Think about it like this. If you're a teacher and a student comes to you and says, hey, my dog ate my homework, right? We've all heard something like that. Maybe you've said it. This is one of the, this is such a, a crazy thing. The kid is implicitly admitting he doesn't have his homework because he's saying the dog ate it. It's the same thing. This is just a cover story. Even the enemies of Jesus had to admit the tomb was empty. The real question they want to know, they won't tell you this, how did it get empty? What happened on that day? Because I'm telling you something. The Romans weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus dead. It's not them. The Jews, oh my goodness, they wanted Jesus to stay dead. They had no reason to steal the body. The disciples, everyone knows, they had no motive, no means. In fact, if you're big into crime, you know the crime triangle. Anyone who knows crime says you've got to have opportunity, means, and motive. And that's the perfect crime. The disciples didn't have any of this. They were poor. They didn't have the means to bribe people and do this. They didn't have the motive. They needed Jesus to appear. They weren't going to steal the body. Besides, we have seven credible sources affirming the disciples lived horrible, rough, depriving lives because they stuck to their story, this guy really did rise from the dead. And they had horrible deaths because of it. If you missed last week, go listen to that. You can read about what really happened. Every one of them had a chance to recant, and not one of them did. Were every one of them liars? Were every one of them lunatics? Or is Jesus really Lord? All right, now, the empty tomb alone isn't enough. So we have the appearances, okay? And these are rapid fire. The first one's going to take a minute, but the rest are going to be rapid fire, so be ready. Nine ancient sources that confirm that the disciples absolutely were convinced Jesus rose from the dead, and he appeared to them, okay? The first one in rapid fire is this, the creed. We have the creed. The creed's found in 1 Corinthians 15, okay? The Apostle Paul literally states an early creed of the church. 
We touched on it briefly last week, but if you missed it, here it is. Read it with me. It says this. For what I received, I passed on to you as of primo importance, okay? Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared still to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time. Okay, so not a mass hallucination going on here. Most of whom are still alive. So if you don't believe me, you can go check it out. They're all here. They can easily confirm it or rebuke it. Okay, though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. All right, now if you're investigating a crime or you're looking at evidence, Something that they will tell you is most important to them is the timeline. You ever notice that? The timeline. The earlier, the better. The closer you can get to the source of the crime, the better. The more accurate it's deemed to be, more reliable. So Gary Habermas, who's a, a resurrection expert and a scholar, put together a timeline that is so fascinating. You ready for this? All right. Depending on how you do your dating methodology, Jesus was crucified somewhere between 30 A.D. and 33 A.D. Most of us lean towards 33 A.D. But there's a little wiggle room, and that's not a big deal. Paul, we know, wrote 1 Corinthians around 54 AD, 55 AD, okay? So within 25 years of Jesus' execution, all right? Now check this out, okay? Look closely. Notice that Paul is using the past tense in this creed. That is not an accident. Paul is using the past tense here, suggesting that he had already given the church in Corinth this creed sometime earlier. He's referring back to it, okay? So this dates the creed, the very first creed of the early church, even earlier, which gives it even more credibility. But guess what? We can go even earlier still to the actual resurrection. Paul, remember, before Paul was Paul, he went by another name. Anybody know? Saul. Saul of? Mmm. You got it. Saul of Tarsus. Did he like Christians? He hated him, okay? I know we have some guests and some new people checking out the faith. Long story short, Saul was a bad dude. Devout Jew, hated Christianity, wanted to stamp it out. Was killing him, putting him in jail, doing all he could. He was a hater, and he was trying to persecute early Christians. Sometime right after Jesus' death, within one, maybe two, three years of Jesus' death, Paul, Saul is walking down the road to Damascus, and he encounters the risen Christ. And it changes his world, as Jesus does. It changed his life, and he becomes no longer Saul, but now he becomes the Apostle Paul. He goes to Damascus. He meets with some apostles, and a lot of scholars believe that this is when he starts learning about the resurrection and that he was given this creed. Some people say it was when he met with Peter for 15 days in Jerusalem. Either way, we see this is coming from eyewitnesses, okay? So check this out. Paul describes this meeting in Galatians chapter 1, and he uses a very unique word. He uses the Greek word, Historia. I'm such a nerd. This is awesome. Okay, look. It means literally to inquire, to examine, to investigate, to personally find out, to learn, to have that inquiry, okay? So this tells us Paul, this was personal to him. This was a personal inquiry. So this is why scholars believe this is when Peter and James gave Paul this creed. So either way, Paul was given this creed within a couple of years of the crucifixion, probably around 34 A.D., maybe 35. By then, though, it's already in creedal form. So what's happened? For it to have been established as a creed, it had already been given, even earlier. I love what James Gunn says, the historian. He says this, this tradition, this creed, we can be entirely confident was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' death. So there's no big time gap. There's no big conspiracy or legend or myth that could be formulated and spread that he rose from the dead. Guys, this is a newsflash. This takes you right back to the scene. If you're a skeptic like I was, this is historical gold. The timeline is so powerful. The creed's historical credentials are so impressive. Even a Jewish New Testament scholar, the great Lapid, wrote this. He said that Christian's first creed can be considered as a statement of eyewitnesses pretty straightforward. That is so powerful. The next source, though, is, of course, Paul himself. Paul actually knew these apostles. He knew them personally. He knew Peter. We know he knew James and John. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 11, regarding the resurrection, Paul says, whether then it's me 
or them, Peter, James, and John, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. He's talking about the resurrection. He was confirming the fact everyone who encountered the resurrected Jesus was all in. There was no myth, no creating uh, a, a series of lies or any conspiracy. The third one is the sermon summaries found all over Acts. Even scholars will look and say, yeah, those are sermons from the early church. There's no lie. They didn't make these up. They're historically accurate. And guess what they frequently focused on? The resurrection. Almost all the sermons were about that. The early sermons confirmed the resurrection. Peter himself said this in Acts 2. He said, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Think about that. 3,000 people agreed, got saved, and the early church was born. Woo! Hallelujah, pass the Tylenol. That is good stuff. Sources 4, 5, 6, and 7. See, I told you to go fast. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every one of them encountered the risen Jesus. The distinguished professor at Houston Theological Seminary, Craig Evans, said that he said, there's every reason to conclude that the Gospels were fairly and accurately reported on the essential elements of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. They are early enough they're rooted into the right streams that go back to Jesus and the original people. There's continuity, there's proximity, there's verification of certain distinct points with archeology, span this is gold, other documents, and then there's the inner logic. Boom, y'all looking for this? This is it right here, number eight, Clement. We got the testimony of one of the earliest church fathers. This is an apostle who personally knew Peter Peter was the one who ordained him. Y'all remember when we ordained Pastor Jason a year ago, right? It would be as if he was talking, yeah, I know Pastor Matt. Hey, we have a close connection, a close friendship. That's how close Clement was to Peter. And then Clement also wrote a letter to the Corinthians. We just don't hear about it. And he said this, the apostles had complete certainty caused by what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They're so confident. They know the resurrection is legit. And the final reference. The final source, Polycarp himself. Polycarp, the one who was appointed by the Apostle John. John was the one who was the beloved disciple, exiled on the Isle of Patmos, who got the book of Revelation downloaded to him. Yeah, that guy. He is the one who ordained the first pastor of Smyrna. His name was Polycarp. Polycarp, like Paul, wrote a letter to the Philippians where he talked about the resurrection. Not once, not twice, not three times, four times. No less than five times, Polycarp kept talking about the resurrection. And then talking about the apostles, he said this. For these apostles, they didn't love the present age. They weren't in love with this world. But rather, they loved him who died for our benefit and for our sake was, what are those three words? Raised by God. So guys, we have nine ancient sources, and I just flew through that. Multiple eyewitnesses, testimonies, so many people who had encountered the resurrected Jesus. So I see my time's almost up. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite the band to come back up, and I want to just recap kind of what we've learned, okay? The evidence is pretty overwhelming. To recap so far, we see Jesus was alive at point A. Not many people dispute that. Jesus was dead at point B. And then the one we spent the most time on, Jesus was alive again and seen by Benny at point C. Why do we go into that? Why does that matter? Hear me. If you missed everything else, hear this. The Lord Jesus is real, and he is alive and well. He is who he says he is. All of his claims have come true. He is the unique son of God. He is the savior of the world. And that means if this is true, then that means his teachings have authority for your life. So you know I gotta ask, are you letting them have influence over your life? Because if he is who he says he is, if he is opening up heaven to every single person who will willingly submit to repent of sin and follow him, the free gift of forgiveness, the free gift of eternal life, he purchased on that awful, brutal cross. My last question, why? Why would any man do that? And the answer, right there that fourth word he did it out of love for God so loved what's your name there that he gave his only begotten son whoever believes in him shall not perish 
but have everlasting life. Think about that. The God of the universe loves you with such intensity, such passion, that he said, you don't have to bear the punishment for sin. I'll take it. That's why we call it good news. That's why we weirdly call it Good Friday. What is good about a man being beaten and killed? That. He takes our sin. No other religion, no other false thing claims that. Our God dies for us. Who does that? What love? Someone who would willingly enter our world and endure torture and death in order to redeem us. Thank you, Jesus. If you've never encountered that love, if you've never encountered that forgiveness, today is your day. Would you bow with me? Very reverently, very quietly. I just want to pray together, and I want to pray over you. And, and if today is your day and you sense that something is tugging at your heart, that's the Holy Spirit. And you know that maybe you need to be right with him. Today is your day. Would you just, in your own words, pour out your heart to him? Make him your heart's cry. Tell him, Lord Jesus, you say to seek and I will find. You say to ask and I'll receive. You say to knock and the door will be open. So I ask, I seek, I knock. Will you meet me here? I agree with your word. I freely confess that I have sinned no different than anyone else in this room. And today I'm ready to turn from my sin, to repent. God, I want to receive your Holy Spirit into my life. I believe in my heart that you rose from the dead. And here in this moment, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I surrender to your Lordship. I accept your sacrifice, what we've talked about these last many days. That was the full payment for all the wrong I've done. Thank you, Jesus. I turn my life over to you, to your leading, and I ask you to invade my life, take control from this day forward. And I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I want to tell you something. If you prayed that prayer, maybe you're listening, you're going to watch this later sometime. Based on the word of God, you are a new creation. If you genuinely meant and from a heart of repentance. Luke chapter 15 tells us that there is great rejoicing in heaven anytime a lost soul comes home. If that was you, we rejoice with you. I would love for you to tell me. Just come up after church. It doesn't have to be long. I just want to celebrate with you. Try to get you plugged in somewhere, a home church, if not here, somewhere where God's word is respected and taught. You need to grow as a follower of Christ. Don't want people getting born again and then left at the altar. We want you to grow and we genuinely care. So as we finish, here's what we like to do. We like to sing one last song and open up the altar. It's the highlight of the day. God's word is spoken. He is here. What's he been saying to you? Maybe you want to come and kneel for a minute, two minutes, and pray for a lost person who desperately needs to hear this good news. Maybe you have a doctor's diagnosis coming up or a test or some looming thing and you just, there's power when you come and give it to the Lord. Maybe you just want to come and kneel for a minute. Pray for your country. Pray for the brokenness that we see. No one will bother you. This is your time. Maybe you want to make right where you are an altar. You're welcome to do that. You can sing. This is your time. We just have two or three minutes. We love just to kind of let the Holy Spirit speak to us. So very reverently, very quietly, would you stand with me? You're going to see the words on the screen. The gospel has been preached. Just be obedient to what he leads. The altar is open. You come now.